it's an honor to introduce our first keynote speaker. She once studied sociology at what used to be the Faculteit Sociale Wetenschap and now called the Erasmus School of Social and Behavioral Sciences. And she is the New York based correspondent in the US for one of the largest Dutch daily newspapers, Algemeen Dagblad. And with us, she will discuss the best practices of the four years Trump presidency. Answer the questions, has he been successful in these four years? Has he lived, lived up to the expectations? And what will the consequences of the economic recession due to the COVID crisis be with regards to the possibilities of him being re-elected in a couple of weeks? Please welcome Carlijn van Houweling. Good morning, speaking from New York. Uh, good afternoon in Europe, in the Netherlands. Um, Erasmus asked me to speak about the successes of the Trump administration. And for that, I'd like to start with a concern that many American voters had in 2016 about this man that you see here on my left. Um, I think it's something that has been overlooked uh, in 2016, a significant part of American voters thought that the U.S. had become too soft and too feminine under Obama. Um, and if you think about traditionally feminine and masculine behaviors, Obama was a relatively feminine president. You may remember, as you can see in this photo, his tears live on TV when he talked about um, victims of gun violence or how he talked about his family life, reading bedtime stories to his daughters. Um, and this image of him as a family man, while some Americans wanted him to stand up to Iran, stand up to enemies, um, it led to four out of 10 voters complaining in polls that the US had become too soft. Uh, and that sentiment was particularly very strong under Trump voters. Uh, more than two thirds of them uh, agreed with that statement. Uh, I uh, touched on this in my book, it's called this is America, this is America. It's about sex and gender in the US. Uh, and one of the elements is how central masculinity is to the American presidency. Um, you can see it happening in the debates. The candidates are trying to prove that they are a real man, prove their manliness. One of the worst things that can be said about a presidential candidate is that you're soft on crime or weak on defense. Because um, that's what a significant portion of the American population is looking for when they are voting for a presidential candidate, a bodyguard, a protector. And uh, one of the things that Trump has successfully done is playing into that desire for a strong masculine leader. Um, Trump has always played that game. I'll show you some images. The one on the left is uh, an image that he shared himself on his Twitter account. So it gives you an indication of, of what he's trying to portray. The others come from his supporters. They're all over the internet. Um, recently, you may have seen how he talks about him um, getting infected with coronavirus. It's all about beating the virus, bravely defeating the virus, confronting it head on and not being afraid of it. Uh, of course, you can argue about how strong it actually makes someone look, ignoring medical advice. Um, but it, this image of the macho president worked very well for Donald Trump in 2016. Um, and he's clearly betting that it can be a successful strategy again uh, in 2020. Um, so if we speak about successes of the Trump administration, um, I think this is one of the successful strategies that, that he um, uh, operated. If we think about success in the sense of accomplishment, though I thought it was an interesting assignment from Erasmus uh, in the middle of um, multiple level crisis uh, on the economy. Uh, there's a health crisis going on with more than 200,000 deaths in the US, uh, social unrest, climate crisis in the West, democracy is under pressure. Um, it seems pretty hopeless sometimes, I must say. Uh, recently, that Mood took me on a trip to 10 towns called Hope um, in, all, yeah, in, in 10 different states all over the US. Um, it took me to small town USA because 
most of these towns called Hope are small. And what I heard over and over again from people who are planning to vote for Trump is that Trump is the one who gives them hope in these uncertain times. Um, I think that's one of the remarkable um, things. Let me change the slide. Yes, you can see it here. Um, the support for Donald Trump has actually been remarkably strong. This is his approval rating, so the percentage of Americans that says they think he's doing a good job as president. Um, and even now in the pandemic that most Americans think he's not handling very well, there is a pretty stable group that still supports him. You can see here that he starts with uh, a little uh, more than 40%. He is still at a little more than 40% support. So he's been very successful in keeping his supporters behind him. It helps that the U.S. is very polarized. Um, people don't see members of the other party or people who vote for the other party as just citizens with another opinion. They're seen as the enemy, as danger. Um, so yeah, that of course makes it easier to keep your um, to keep your people uh, on your side. Um, but there's also some things that Trump has successfully done. We tend to forget them in the chaos we see unfold nowadays. So I'd like to highlight some of them. You may note that they are relatively small. The big peace deal with North Korea that he promised never came, for example. Um, but Donald Trump did manage to make NATO members pay more for their defense. The Secretary General credited Donald Trump. And this is something that um, the US has wanted for a long time. There is uh, trade where he renegotiated NAFTA, a big trade agreement with Canada and Mexico. Uh, even Joe Biden acknowledged recently that the new agreement is better than what used to be there. Um, China, there's a lot of animosity, a lot of tension, but Donald Trump did manage to uh, get to a phase one deal, as it was called, where China agreed to buy more American agricultural products. We have to see if this all comes true um, uh, because of the pandemic. It may not actually uh, happen as it was negotiated, but for Trump supporters, this is something that they credit him for. They see that there was a result. Um, hostages, I think that's a very symbolically important one. Trump has managed to get some American hostages home from abroad. and. Uh, especially the families of those people um, credit him for doing more than Barack Obama. And that's, of course, something that Trump is using. You can see it in the image. He invited those hostages to the White House to send the, the footage of that to, um, to voters during the National Convention of the Republican Party. The Middle East, we've seen some positive developments there recently. Um, Israel normalized relations with two Arab states. The Trump, administ Trump administration does deserve credit for quietly helping to negotiate that deal. There have been some pretty disastrous, disastrous moves as well, uh, abandoning the Kurds, for example. Um, but when American voters look at the big picture, they also see that the leader of ISIS was taken out and then ISIS lost a lot of its territory or most of its territory. And then the economy, that's a big one. I hear that a lot from uh, Trump supporters. But um, if you look at the numbers in the polls, Americans still trust Trump more than Biden to handle the economy. And that's based on rosy numbers from before the pandemic. The economy was doing well, people remember that. Um, and they hope that he can bring that back. You can of course argue about that because um, you could say that the, the dire situation was more dire economically because of the way Trump did not get the pandemic under control. Um, he inherited part of that uh, upbeat economy from the Obama, from the Obama administration. Um, but those good times are still on the minds of, of American voters. Then there is criminal justice reform. It's an important one. The U.S. locks up more people in prison than any country in the world. And Trump is the president who signed a law that makes some important changes, relatively small but important. Reduced sentences, for example, for people who got really harsh sentences for relatively minor crimes. Um, that's something that benefits 
mostly the black community in the U.S. because they are the uh, the group that bears the brunt of uh, mass incarceration, as it's called. Um, so this is definitely appreciated. And there is one big accomplishment that I think um, kind of makes conservative Americans forget about everything else that happened during the Trump administration, filling the courts. Trump has been filling the American courts with conservative judges, uh, especially in powerful appeals courts. So that's right under the Supreme Court. Um, he has been appointing people at a pace that hasn't been se hasn't been seen since the 70s. He, you can see in the graphic that he appointed about the same number of judges as Obama in two terms. Uh, he only has one term so far. It means that 30% now in, of the judges in those appeals courts is a conservative appointed by Trump. Um, it seems at the moment that he's also going to be able to appoint a third Supreme Court judge. Um, so that means that also a third out of nine Supreme Court judges will be a conservative appointed by Trump. Um, he appoints young judges, remarkably young people, and they serve for life. So this rightward shift can last for decades. Um, the judges he appoints uh, interpret the constitution in a very literal way as it was written in its time. Um, so most of those judges are thought to be sympathetic to opposing abortion, for example, to give businesses free range and to be very pro-religion. Um, and that's part of the reasons, part of the reason that Republicans and conservative Americans tend to accept a lot from Donald Trump. The guy on the right is Mitch McConnell. He is um, the leader of the Republican Party in the Senate. This is, well, his wet dream, you could say. Um, whatever else happened, in this sense, for conservative, conservatives, the presence, presidency of Donald Trump has been a big success. Um, they have influenced the course of the country for decades to come. If that's desirable, that's another question. You may not think it is, but for um, a significant portion of Trump's voters, it is. That's what I wanted him to do. Um, so that's the bottom line here, that there are real accomplishments, especially from the perspective of Trump supporters who have seen him do what they wanted him to do. The question, I think, is mostly how they weigh both sides of the story, accomplishments versus failures, because, of course, the failures are also there. The broken promises, the social unrest, the pandemic that got out of control, the more than 200,000 Americans that have passed away after an infection, economic trouble. That's the question voters are going to answer. Um, how do they weigh accomplishment versus failure? Um, I think if he loses, you could say that he himself blew it. He was definitely on a path to re-election earlier this year. The economy was doing great, and that was one of his strongest... It was his strongest argument, and everything collapsed, of course, because the pandemic hit, and um, that's not his fault, but he could have done more to get it under control um, uh, in a way that would maybe not have affected the economy um, as it has done that now. Um, I know people like to predict, I get that question a lot, who do you think is going to win? I learned there is little value in prediction in 2016. Joe Biden uh, has um, uh, a good position, he's doing well. Um, it seems most likely that Joe Biden will win, but Donald Trump um, is absolutely still uh, an important contender and he still has uh, a good chance to um, to end up as uh, as a re-elected president. Um, the only poll that counts is what they say is the poll on election day. And I think we learned four years ago that that's how we should look at it. Um, we'll have to see on November 3rd. If anyone has questions, I would be happy to answer them. Your, your uh, talk on 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 the, the weighing accomplishments versus versus the failures of, of Trump and for giving us a sort of overview in that. Uh, one of the 
um, promises he made, or one of the, I think, the expectancies was, even from uh, the Trump skeptics, was that he would do something, uh, he, he would place America first, he would do something about the American economy, he would do something about jobs, and he would do something about the American infrastructure, for example. To what extent uh, did he? Uh, and and uh, what do Americans uh, think about his accomplishments in, in, in that area. If you speak about infrastructure, for example, that was actually one of um, the very few topics where the left and the right agree in the US. The American infrastructure um, is really not in good shape. You can see it with your own eyes if you drive through the country or, or drive through New York even. Um, Trump announced big plans, a trillion uh, he was going to spend, he said. Um, so far, nothing has happened. Part of the reason is that he uh, quit negotiating with the Democrats because they were investigating him. He didn't want to work with the Democrats anymore on infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so he dropped it because of his personal uh, anger towards the Democrats. Um, I think that has not been a very smart move because infrastructure is something that affects everyone and um, nothing has really changed there. Uh, people see that, of course. They do see that that nothing has happened there. Yeah, you, you started started out talking about uh, Obama and, and, and saying that uh, at least a number of Americans thought he was too feminine, too soft uh, in his approach, especially in geopolitics. Um, how, how is the the, 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 the emotion or uh, to, towards uh, the Obama administration uh, changed with uh, having had four years uh, of Trump in the White House among Americans? Are, are there a lot of people who are looking, looking back no, filled with nostalgia? Yes, there's a lot of nostalgia. And I think Joe Biden is trying to exploit that or use that to his advantage. Mm -hmm. His whole candidacy mm -hmm. is nostalgia for, for the Obama administration. Yeah. Um, it may work because the Trump, and Trump administration has been such a wild ride that a lot of Americans are tired of it. Um, yeah. they want do you really to think that Joe Biden still has the... Uh, can he profit from the Obama aura because he's uh, a, a number of years older, he's white, uh, and Obama is not his VP as he used to be for, for Obama. So, so how much can he profit from, the, from that, do you think? He can. One of the reasons that he is, not the only reason, but one of the reasons that he is doing very well in the black community here in the U.S. Um, is that they see him as um, the guy who worked with Obama, with the first black president, and that definitely gives him credits there. Um, of course, now he is the front runner. People uh, dig into his uh, record into his voting history, into there's more focus on him personally. Um, but there's a reason that uh, Barack Obama is going to campaign him in the last week, going to campaign for him in the last couple of weeks, because the Democrats definitely think that they can still um, uh, take advantage of, of the image of the Obamas, both of them, not only Barack Obama, but also Michelle Obama. Um, they're yep. very popular figures let's uh, take some some questions from from the, the the viewers one of them is whether uh, where joe biden is on the scale of masculinity and how will this affect uh, his battle for the presidency that's a good question i think joe biden is also um he's an interesting figure because on the one hand he's he's someone who um talks a lot about loss in his family um loss has defined his life. He, he lost his first wife and his baby daughter um, when he was 30 years old. Uh, later, he lost his adult son to cancer. Um, and he's very empathetic. He, he connects with people, especially when they also lost someone in their lives. And of course, a lot of people uh, deal with that uh, on a personal level. On the one hand, you see him, uh, on the other hand, you see him in, in getting into these masculine fights with Donald Trump, where he once said, for example, that he would beat him up behind the school as if they were if they were schoolboys. Um, so he definitely uh, uh, tries to play that game with Donald Trump and tries to um, uh, to get ahead of him there. 
Mm-hmm. I think if uh, one of the reasons if Joe Biden wins, uh, where Hillary Clinton couldn't win when she ran against Donald Trump, then one of the reasons is that Joe Biden is a man and can play that that masculinity game, and Hillary Clinton yeah. couldn't. Beat him, beat him up on the on the schoolyard. Yeah. One other question: How do you think that the Trump's infection with coronavirus uh, has affected his campaign and and Biden Biden's campaign, and and uh, consequently will uh, affect the, the the polls and and ultimately the the elections uh, on the third of November? That was, uh, I would say, very bad for Trump's campaign. You can see it in in the polls um, that the the gap between Trump and Biden at the moment is getting bigger, which Mm -hmm. doesn't have to mean that that's going to be the result in the election. Um, But it meant that the focus was on Trump's coronavirus response again, and it made the election a referendum about about the way he handled the pandemic. Um, And we know from polls that most Americans don't think he handled it well. So um, the more the campaign is about COVID, the worse that is for Donald Trump. Yeah. So nobody bought his his speech on on the 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 the, the, in front of the White House saying, I beat the coronavirus and I will make medicine, the medicine I got available for every one of you. And 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 so 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 being the, the, the big masculine leader that fought uh, for uh, the American public, you are saying that the American public didn't I, I buy it. Say and it will... I wouldn't say nobody. Because um, I, I was traveling around the country um, through rural areas where Donald Trump is very popular, and um, he's still popular with lots of people there. And you can see it in his approval ratings. It is a minority, it's um, a little more than 40% of people, but there is about 40% of Americans think he's doing a good job. The question now, if, if if they're still thinking that in the last weeks before the election, but I met lots of people in the last couple of weeks who feel that the pandemic is not something you can blame the president for because no one knows how to deal with a pandemic. Um, that's something very new. We, we all had to um, uh, adjust to that is what they say. Um, and they like the cheerleading approach that Donald Trump takes. He uh, he has said that, that he wants to be a cheerleader for the economy, for the country to get back on its feet. Um, there is definitely a group of Americans that does appreciate that. Yeah. Carlijn, uh, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, good luck in the next uh, weeks. Uh, will you be uh, having a vacation after the 3rd of November or will the real job finally start then as a U.S. correspondent? I'm afraid the real job will start after the 3rd of November. We'll have to see. Okay. If, if one of those candidates wins in a landslide, it may all be very clear, but there is a good chance that we're going to see a lot of debate and discussion and legal challenges uh, about the, the results of the election. Yeah. Well, thanks for being there on behalf of us. Uh, Carlijn van Houwelingen, thank you. Thank you.